Shalom and welcome again to Seekers of Meaning, the podcast TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I am your host, Rabbi Richard Edris. Thank you very, very much for joining us, uh, especially on this week as we move into the days of all the high holiday season. And um, we want to focus a little bit on some of the aspects of what many of you will experience, hopefully, in these uh, next several weeks. And that is the power, the power, and in many ways, the passion of the sacred music that will accompany us uh, on this journey in these next 10 days. And to do that, we are very pleased and honored to welcome to today's Seekers of Meeting, Chazana Alisa Pomerantz Boro of Bethel in beautiful Voorhees, New Jersey. <laughs> Alisa, thank you very, very much for joining us. I know this is a very, very challenging time. First of all, condolences uh, on uh, the loss of your dad. And I appreciate your time given that. And also, on the eve of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I know it's uh, you probably have a lot of things to take care of um, during this season of the year. We want to thank you again. So, the power of music. Um, so, all, we're going to be walking into shul, whether it's uh, in person or through the Zoom machine, as many of our people do now. And... Um, in many ways, are going to be way to be transformed not only by the words of the prayer book and, and and sermons, but to be quite honest with you, having done this for about fifty some years, the power of the music that transforms us. Walk me through you as the chazan. How how does how does the music of this season of the year give you a spiritual boost? Um, what does it mean to you? <laughs> Well, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you for welcoming me. It's really my honor. And thank you for the condolences on my beloved father, Rabbi Moshe Pomerantz. Um, I'm going to try my best to, uh, to continue to inspire the way he inspired me and countless, countless others for so many years, 90 wow. years to be exact. Um, yeah, really a blessing. And, um, as difficult as it is, I know that he would want me to continue to be passionate about music, tefillah, and Yiddishkeit in general, all the things he was as well. His father was a chazan. He was a rabbi, congregational rabbi, um, for many, many years. And uh, so I, I continue his legacy. Uh, yes, music is powerful, always has been, and the words are as well. Many people do say that music speaks louder than words. Another uh, colleague of mine always says, nobody walks out of shul humming the sermon. I don't mean no deference to any of my rabbinic colleagues because uh, the words are powerful and meaningful, as are the words of the, of the liturgy. Um, and music can be a way to connect us, especially so many people are not familiar with the words. Many people cannot read Hebrew even if they can, they might not be able to keep up. And let's be honest, there are a lot of words. There are a lot of pages to get through um, in the Mahsor to get us through the liturgy. And in recent years, I, I used to be like, how come people aren't singing along all the time? In recent years, I, I discovered that the power can come in moments. So when somebody leaves shul, they're not going to remember five hours of davening. They will remember something. They'll remember the way a certain blessing made them feel. They'll remember the way some kind of music, whether it's a nigun, a misi naitun, which means, you know, one of those things you would just never change, like kol nidre, and they have all the memories. I have so much to say. All the memories of their childhood, maybe their zaidi, their saba, their grandfather, sitting in shul together, and the, the, the powerful memories that that evokes. And for some people, it's connecting to more modern music, more things that they can recognize, because as has always been the case in history, Jewish music has been um, defined really by what's going on around us, right? So during the classical era, era there were many pieces composed for the synagogue that sounded very similar to classical music. Much of the high church, if you will, kind of music that many, much of it is still done. Then there are musical motifs, like little melodies that you hear 
that sound recognizable. So the way my professor, uh, Hazan Max Wolberg, Zihonoli Bracha, taught us is that you should be able to walk into shul on any given day and know what day it is just by the melodies that you hear, right? So, you know, people can't necessarily do that anymore because they're maybe not as knowledgeable. And if they only come to shul on the high holidays, which gig is into hate, it's lovely and we love having you together, whether you're in person or on live stream, wherever you may be, I want it to be meaningful. So I need, as my role as a chazan is to be mindful of the past and of what we call tradition, traditional music, misinai, if you will, and also be mindful that people need a way to feel emotionally connected. If they don't understand the words, who lives and who dies, you know, unatana tokif, those are powerful words. To me, I understand what I'm saying and even more so this year for me it's 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 going to be very difficult to get through those yeah. words yes um so in, in recent years i started after i saw the um the musical hamilton i started adding this that phrase who lives who dies who tells your story it's totally thematically connected to unitata tokev and it resonates with Amha, with the people, because pe most many people have heard Hamilton. And even if they haven't seen it or heard it, they can hear those words and go, oh, wow, that's powerful. So you you you, you mentioned before, just briefly, you just skip right over. I always just want to come back to it because people ask about it a lot. The concept of Jewish music. But, and you allude to the fact that, that our music, quote unquote, is really a melting pot of all the cultures, isn't it? That, that, that we, and even some of the, 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 the melodies of traditional, quote, traditional prayers will change if you hear them in Barcelona or if you hear them in Frankfurt or if you hear them in Boise, Idaho. Well, maybe not Boise, Idaho. But... <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about how the, and the, the, this sort of like melting pot aspect of the music. Well, that's what, what I said earlier is that that's my job. That's why I'm the professional, if you will. I'm My job as the cantor of the synagogue is to be mindful of all those things, of what I called me sinai, meaning I'm never going to change kol nidre. People need to hear kol nidre, right? We call it me sinai because that's one of those things like chas v'shal, you should not change because I think that in Boise and in Barcelona, they're, they're hearing Kol Nidre pretty similarly. However, I wrote a little nigun that I've incorporated into Kol Nidre. I do that so that my community, my shul, my Bethel family can join me and feel that they are participating actively. Whether they sing or not, that's up to them, but there's something that they can also latch on to. So, you know, that's not throwing out all, the whole Kol Nidre tune. It's augmenting what already exists and making it more personal, more accessible. Some of, some of the high holiday music really uh, portrays the mood. So you alluded to very quickly the Unitana Tokef, which is the, the powerful prayer. Walk us through... So people are going to be sitting there and they're going to hear whether it's the cantor, cantor at a choir or just a choir, depending upon the synagogue. But the setting of the Unitana Togep, that's supposed to convey a certain mood, is it not? Absolutely. And I think it's it's serious and and powerful, the words and the melody. Now, I, I'm a big believer in improvisation. It's kind of like jazz and chazanut or cantorial music has a lot of that element. Again, there are motifs. By motifs, I mean like, you know, the end of the of the blessing is going to be da, da, da. And everybody says, ah, may. That's a recognizable motif, musical motif. Unitana Tokev also has some recognizable motifs and has some musical moments that are participatory that the congregation sings along and i would never change those but the rest of it i often improvise because the words incite 
emotion for me. And I hope by my emotion, I can convey that to the congregation so that their prayer experience is a combination of active participation, active listening, active emotional response. And and I don't think everybody has to sing at all times. I think there are moments of listening, moments to happy clappy, and moments of solemn emotional response, just like a the, song. The, the, you, you mentioned this before, and um, there may be a, one or two people who listen to this or watch this who, who may not be aware. The change in the music style, uh, motif, if you will, for different Shabbatot, for different holidays, um, that the Borchu for Hanukkah may not be the same as the Borchu for Shvuot or, or the Borchu that they'll hear uh, for the high holidays. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that. So if people hear that, they'll now understand, oh, this is for this holiday or that motif or that mode. Go ahead. Again, that's that's traditional Jewish music. The way that I learned and experienced is that you should know what day it is by what you hear. Again, if you're not in shul on one of the three festivals, hearing the different melodies, and on the high holidays, hearing the different melodies to the same tunes, even the Shema changes, right? The Shema that everybody knows how to sing, probably the first prayer that you learned as a little kid, and the last prayer that you hear before you leave this earth. That melody changes too. So people ask me all the time, oh, Chazan, why did you change you know, this? And why? how come it's not the traditional melody? Well, what is the traditional melody? Do they know? And I'm trying to teach, by example, we also offer classes. We teach um, some classes leading up to the high holidays in preparation. So there's some understanding of it. We're speaking with uh, Chazan Alisa Pomerantz Boro of Bethel in beautiful Voorhees, New Jersey, <laughs> in the neighborhood where we are, to be quite honest with you. Full disclosure, uh, we're all here in South Southern New Jersey. And uh, we're going to be right back with uh, the Chazan after this brief note. For 20 years, the Lubetkin Media Companies have been producing award-winning audio and video programs. We produce audio podcasts, documentaries, seminar panels, conference speaker videos, tribute videos, and family legacy videos. And of course, the Seekers of Meaning TV show and podcast for Rabbi Richard Address and JewishSacredAging.com. I'm Steve Lubetkin, and I'd love to invite you to explore the ways that we can tell your story in sound and images. Please visit our website at beingthemedia.com where you'll see examples of our work for other clients. And if you'd like more information, please email steve at beingthemedia.com. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you out there on the net. Take good care. Lisa Pomerantz Boro, Bethel in Voorhees, New Jersey. Um, the you mentioned also this concept of the nigun, and the um, which is basically a melody without words. Correct. Correct. It's the yaba baba bim bam, and then and, and and the chanting, and this differs from denomination to denomination. I was raised in a classical reform synagogue across the river at Knesset, Israel. In the old days of good old classical German reform, you know, you don't even you don't even say anything, okay? Um, but the 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 nigunim, the chanting, the davening, that has almost a mystical power to it, doesn't it? It does for me. I hope it does for other people. I love to daven. I love to pray. And I love traditional, we use that word, it's not one of my favorite words, but we used traditional davening where it's like a lot of murmuring and it's a lot of fast Hebrew. Well, I have found that throughout my career, I have spontaneously crafted melodies. I didn't sit down and write out a nigun. I, it just came to me. 
Um, they're my creations and I use them uh, often now. And some people really like it because they don't have to get all the words in and they can connect to a melody that evokes a feeling. And they're not all happy clappy. I say, in fact, the, the niganim that have come out of me, divinely inspired, if you will, um, are more dvekasi, more, how do you define that? More um, meditational, perhaps. I um, I came up with the nigun again on the spot. Often I, I I improvise and things come out and I don't remember them. People said, "Oh, I love that," and I'm like, I don't remember what I did. However, there are a few that I do remember, and one that I that I crafted kind of came out of me. I use several times throughout the high holidays. In fact, I use it in Hinani. Hinani is my personal prayer, the prayer that every cantor. Uh, praise. It's a big moment where we're saying, please, God, give me the strength to be able to pray on behalf of the, of my community because I am your messenger. I am asking God for the strength and I'm coming to you humble and I, I, I'm really not feeling worthy, but I need all of you to help me. And so I wanted my community to be engaged in this prayer more than just listening so the nigun that that came to me, I use during Hinani. And it is really powerful for me, and I believe for my congregation, because they're invested in it. They are, I tell them, I ask them, I beg them, please help me, because I need your help, I need your support. We're all in this together. People say, oh, your prayers are higher, yours count. No, we all matter. Every single one of our prayers matters. I'm here to lead. I'm here to help. I'm here to guide. I'm here to teach. But I need my community, my congregation to be praying with me. So they they do that very much during Hinani. Yeah, for people who may not understand, who will sit in the synagogue, talk to me about those moments um, when you're praying and you're the voice of the congregation. And all of a sudden you get that feeling, you get that vibe back from the congregation. <laughs> yeah. There, there's nothing better. There is nothing better. Because for me, the greatest moments of prayer are, there are two. One is when I hear my whole congregation singing with me. There's nothing better than collective voices coming together, lifting our spirits higher. And the other is when, and it's less often, is when I am not aware of my congregation because I am so deeply connected um, to to God, to a divine presence that I am so deeply connected and inspired that I'm not even aware if they're singing or not. And those are both, for me, equally powerful. No, those are those, and they and my and my my experience that it's rare because especially on the high holidays, there's so many things on the bema that you're aware of um but every once in a while you get There's this really feeling like you're in I, I used to call it the zone i mean you really feel that this is a powerful spiritual moment a hundred percent and my goal is for others to have that too do you have a favorite other well, yeah if other people can get that like moment. It can be a moment. It could be a minute. It can be 10 seconds where they are so deeply connected. They almost forget yeah, where you are. Yes. Yes. Do you, do you have a favorite piece of music uh, during the holidays that you look forward to, to doing? Oh, that's hard. I wasn't prepared for that well, question. Um, sorry. <laughs> I have a, it's okay. I have a lot. I mean, I love, I love Avinu Malkenu. Um, because it's so well known and people do sing in full voice for some reason, especially at the end of Naila, when we are really singing strong and you know, you've been fasting for 25 hours and something, I mean, Naila is my favorite service of all time anyway. People's like, how do you do it? Aren't you exhausted after not eating, not drinking and praying all day long? there's something mystical that comes over me and the congregation, the sun is setting and we're, we know we're about to eat. <laughs> and 
like the gates are open and we've made it. We're alive. We've made it to this point. And everybody's singing loud and proud, as I like to say. I don't know if you can see. Oh, you can't see my sign. Loud and proud. And um, that is beyond powerful and moving to yeah, me. Yeah, Neil, is it, it's, it's, I've, uh, unless you, I think you really experience it, and the most powerful high holiday, I remember people gathering and you just sort of, as as somebody, you know, we're on the Bema, about 45 minutes to a, before you know the, the Tequila Gadola will sound, you sort of got this this rush of adrenaline and say, okay, let's, let's, this is great. We're, all, we're, here, we're almost there. Um, yeah, I'll be honest. During the afternoon service, during Mincha, I have a headache. I'm not feeling great. You know, I'm thirsty. I'm a little kvetchy. Um, And then when Ela comes, you are absolutely right. Something else comes over. It's about an hour before, and it's just I get this. It's more than a second wind. I get this extra divine. Yeah, it, it really is. It's. Um... And the arc doors are open the yeah. whole time and people are standing the whole time and people come up. We have a, for lack of a better word, a parade, a procession of people that come and they have a moment in the arc and I get to watch them, you know, like their powerful moment oh, yeah. inspires me I more. used to do that yeah. in yeah. one, one of my congregations. It was one nice. of the most um, powerful moments I've ever had as a rabbi, watching people come to we used to do it at Yisker, mm-hmm. and I would say, I, "You're those those spirits are here. That you you've invited them here. They're here." And I believe oh, that. I, oh, I do, I, believe, I do too. I, be, I believe that when when we're in shul, we have all the generations I, that came. Absolutely, abs. Uh, you know, and sometimes you can really feel that. Oh, aura. I, I I when I was a young rabbi, I I but the older I got. And after, I mean, to be honest with you, after many close friends and my parents died, you really, you, you felt it because you really needed it. I mean, it, it, you, you really need that sense of, you know, almost a spiritual embrace at this moment uh, yeah. for a whole variety of reasons for another, time, yeah. for another conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Cause I'm losing yeah. it. My fa- my father gave me, you know, he was a pulpit rabbi for so many years. And when he retired, finally, for good, for good, um, he gave me um, several of his um, Atara talitot. Like they're, they're the clergy talitot that are small that you wear over a robe for the high holidays. That's the only time I wear them. And because he wanted to see me wearing them while he was here in my congregation. So, you know, I, I have... And uh, I, that tangible thing is going to be hard enough to to not have them here. No, it, it will um, be, uh, and and this will be. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Now we're one Thank story you. for another time. Let's talk about yum bitty die happy moments. Now I I pray that everybody who has lost beloved family members can feel connected deeply during this high holiday season and always. Thank you. Thank Kazan, you. Kazan, what are you looking for for this year? What am I looking forward when, to? When you're going to be on the bema and praying and thinking and reading and giving everything and all the horribleness that's going on in the world, you personally, you've been through a significant transition in your life. Looking forward, when those gates close on Nila, what do you want for you? I want for me the same as I want for everybody. I want, I want peace. I want health. I want healing. I want wholeness. Um, we're really broken. Our world is broken. Each one of us is broken in so many ways. And uh, we need to find a way to feel grounded, to feel connected. I think I think faith gives us that anyway. And being in shul with our with our own synagogue families gives us strength, gives us courage, reminds us that, at least for me, that even when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we want them answered, I know that God puts something inside of each one of us that gives us strength, that says, you've got this, you can handle this too. So you've you've been a, a 
uh, cancer for a couple of years. A couple. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> a few. One of the things uh, that fascinates me now and, and where we are communally and Jewishly is um, in our careers, the amount of substantive change that has taken place within not only the community, but synagogue life. Um, and the changes in music, the music that has come to us for the synagogue and worship, um, as you reflect back from the time you were you know, in school and, and training and the, the pulpit work that you've had and seen these changes, what, what's, are we in a, um, well, what's your feeling about the, all the changes in the, in the incorporation of so many different types of music now within the, within the synagogue? I think that that change is inevitable. Change happens every single day in everything in our lives, not just in synagogue and not just in music, right? Our bodies change, our lives change, the world changes, food changes, our health changes, everything changes. So I think that music also changes, right? What what my 12-year-old, 13-year-old B'nai Mitzvah students are listening to is different than what I listened to when I was their age. Right, <laughs> and um, and I think that it all has value, and it's all meaningful to whatever age you are and to whatever music resonates with you. Again, as I said earlier, I'm mindful of tradition and music and history, and that for the eighty-year-old or the ninety-year-old Alavai, the hundred and one-year-old sitting in shul, they want to hear what they heard as a child. And for the 12 year old, they they completely don't feel connected. And I don't want it to be just boring. I want shul to be meaningful, right? It's not just entertainment, it's meaningful prayer. How do we pray? People don't know how to pray. Maybe they didn't know how to pray a hundred years ago. I don't know. I wasn't here then. I haven't been a chazan that long, um, but I, I the people that used to daven, that knew the murmurai, they're few and far between now. And um, that it breaks my heart a little bit, to be honest. And I'm still going to do it because if I don't teach the next generation how to daven, how to be engaged in shul without just that, yeah, la, 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 which is great. Those are great. And I also feel it's my responsibility that we don't lose our history. Um, because this is a, a, a current topic of conversation within the movements and seminary, are, are you seeing an increase or, or a decrease in the number of younger people who are entering school to be trained to be a cantor? Oh, there's rabbis and cantors, there's a decrease because it, it's a hard job, as you know too well. It, it is demanding and, and taxing. It, it pulls your heartstrings every single day to be there for people in their times of struggle, their times of need, through illness, through, to, through all the life cycle events. It's exhausting. It's also very meaningful. I wouldn't trade it in for anything, even through emotional and physical exhaustion and overwhelming grief and pain, there's so much joy and so much beauty also to be clay Kodesh, to be a clergy person. It saddens me when congregations feel they can do without complete spiritual leaders, meaning if they have a rabbi and they have laity who can sing, okay, that laity may or may not be fully aware of all the things that I've discussed, being mindful of our history of tradition, of Nusach, which is liturgical music, of all the things, and having your finger on the pulse of what's happening now and, and taking it all in and melding it all up in a professional, beautiful way, that's, that's our job. And as a rabbi, it's the same thing, dealing with so much, so much in the world. Who thought that that would be what you would deal with as a rabbi? You're trained to know Talmud and Jewish law. 
Do people really care about it? Well, you got to make sure as a rabbi that they still do care, or that you care, and that you sh- teach that and, and show that. So yeah, there's changes. And I'm hoping that the, the swing will go back the other direction again. There are still congregations who need cantors and who need rabbis. And I think they all do. And uh, I hope that day will come where they all have the the beauty of that experience. Chazana Lisa Parents Boro, thank you for the gifts that you bring to your community uh, and to our tradition. And um, may you continue to give those gifts and in love and in memory, because um, it is a special gift. So thank you. And thank you. And to uh, I wish you just uh, Shana Tova, just health, much health and joy. To all of you, um, thank you very, very much for joining us on today's edition of Secrets of Meaning, the podcast TV arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. Again, if you'd like to make a uh, comment or a suggestion, please feel free to email me at rabbiaddress at jewishsacredaging.com. Visit us on the Jewish Sacred Aging Facebook page. And if you're so moved to help us do these things and like to make a tax-free donation to help support the work, Go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com, and you will find a very conveniently located donate button. Click on that. It's real easy. No problem. Just one, two, three, and we really do appreciate it. Seekers of Meaning is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubetkin Media Companies here in next door to Voorhees in beautiful Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout out to our genius producer, Steve Lubetkin. Thank all of you. We do appreciate your time. Have a very, very meaningful, spiritual, healthy, and healing Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, this season of the year. Thank you for joining us. And until we meet again on the next Seekers of Meaning, take care of yourself. And most of all, be kind to one another. Shalom. Amen. Amen.